which is outside of Boulder. Um, so, uh, and at the, hold on just a second. Okay. At the heart of the book, um, it's really the transformational power of land. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the background of the book and then really focus on this idea of the alchemy of wild places. And uh, I write in my book, um, my earbud just came out. Um, I write in my book that the alchemy of wild places is that they work on you the way wind works on rocks, the way twin trickles flowing in opposite directions on Milner Pass, high in the Rockies becomes the Cache La Poudre and the Colorado. And so I wanted to think about this idea of the transformational power of wild places. And I think it's really apropos right now because we're sheltering in place and during COVID and we're substituting, many of us are substituting um, a more full-time relationship with the natural world, but we're substituting that, that out for the relationships that we have with society or our friends or you know, our workplaces. Um, and so I think this is a real time of thinking about how wild places affect us and not only affect us, but also how we are actually in relationship with those wild places. And I'm assuming many of you are Estes Park residents and maybe you're there year round and you probably do have a very deep relationship with the natural world. And that's one thing I wanna talk about tonight. So really tonight I'm gonna to talk about living wild and um, how a profound relationship with landscape can deepen not only the self, but really, uh, our relationship to ourselves, but also our relationship to the world. Uh, and that's something I believe very deeply. And I think it's our time now to kind of start thinking about, I know we've got a lot of stuff going on with the pandemic, but the pandemic finds its origins in the fact that we've eroded some of our relationships with the natural world. Um, COVID comes from bats, so which shouldn't normally, in, normal, in a healthy planet, that shouldn't have been passed on to humans. But because we're breaking down our ecosystems, and we're breaking down some of these chains that we have with animals, um, some of these things are now creeping in. Um, and I think people are gonna start to reevaluate some of the things that we've done um, to our planet uh, in the name of whatever, convenience and money. I think we're gonna have to start reconciling the fact that we, we live on a living, breathing entity and it's the earth and we need to really think about that. And that entity can also save our lives as it did mine. So, so rough beauty really happened because, uh, uh, oh, so I should say, um, I'm gonna talk for about another 30 minutes, talk and read, and then I'm gonna have to save the last 20 minutes for questions. So I'm happy to answer your questions at the end or hear your comments or anything like that. So I'd like to have a chat at the end. So just so you know. Um, so the book, came about, one of the ways the book came about was I had been trying, I have an MA in poetry and a PhD in fiction writing. And the first, first book I ever wrote was um, this nonfiction memoir, which I never ever planned to write. Uh, but it, it was kind of this, a series of circumstances propelled me toward writing it. The first of which was, um, when I was four, I was almost 40, I just finished my PhD and I was set to kind of start my life as a full-time writer and I moved to this remote mountain cabin and uh, I had it like, you know, my handful of four jobs to keep myself writing at, uh, and um, my cabin burns down nine months later and I lose everything. Uh, this is, uh, it wasn't an act of nature necessarily, it was a wood stove fire a faulty wood stove, the door on the wood stove came open, I was gone. But that cabin was also heated by a wood stove. And uh, so I lost everything. And I didn't have insurance, I was a renter. And uh, I had to start over. I turned 40 and had to start over. And uh, so I had to, you know, these kinds of disasters cause us to reevaluate our lives and to think about what's important and where we're going and where we've been and why is it working the way we want it to work. And so, um, and so that is the beginning of the book. I talk about how I, you know, tried to do this, you know, thing, tried to have my own Thorovian experience and my cabin burns down. And I actually end up moving to a cabin that wasn't 
necessarily very far away, about a couple, a mile or two as the crow flies, and it was another woods that he had cabin, interestingly enough. And there I did spend 10 years uh, and did have a Thoreauian experience. Um, uh, but the book is really about, so you think, I thought I was, I was working on a collection of essays because I had this very dramatic fire. And I thought, oh, I'll write about seasonal living and I'll write about the seasons. And um, then uh, I uh, got a piece published in the New York Times and in short order, I had an agent and a book proposal and a sold book. And, um, and everything that they, the agent and also my editor at Scribner said to me was, you can't just write nature essays, you have to write a memoir and Karen is a character who changes over time. And that forced me to kind of really look at some things. The first of which was, how did I end up in the mountains? And um, now I'm a woman who spent most of her life alone. I happen to be married now, but that is a new thing. I got married last year. Um, I, uh, but up until uh, just a few years ago, <laughs> I was resolutely and uh, solidly single and, um, and I was determined to do it all by myself. And so I needed to kind of look at the choices I made, which were to live remotely and be alone and be isolated and uh, cultivate what I call my cowgirl ethos. Uh, so the book really becomes about this journey that I took about finding my place in the world and finding roots and rootedness. Um, and this really rises, for me, it rises out of uh, two factors in my life. The first factor is that I had a very transient childhood and transient kind of family. So what I mean by that is that my dad was kind of kicked around by, we were kicked around by my dad's Air Force career and we didn't move as much as many people did, but it was enough, uh, you know, probably. And I don't think uh, until I lived in that cabin when I was, between the ages of 40 and 50, I don't think that I lived any place longer than three years. So, and uh, so I was always moving around. So I had this very kind of, um, I always wanted to be from somewhere, right? I always wanted to, uh, there were no summers on the farm in my family. There were no kind of container of family to hold us together. We were second and third generation immigrants who kind of came to the United States and scattered. Um, my family is not close. And so this is a, a, a longing that I have. And I think it's a longing that many of us have. Who am I? Where do I belong? Where do I come from? Where are my roots? And I had that very um, strongly. And, and the one constant in my life has always been um, the, the, the outdoors. That, that's the one thing my family was not we didn't have a lot of money. Our one vacation was camping. Um, and so the outdoors provided this place where, uh, you know, it was more than just relaxation. There was some kind of solace. And so that was the one constant that I had in my life. And I, so I think one of the reasons why I chose to live remotely was because of this experience as a kid, you know, really thinking that the mountains were this place that felt okay for me. Um, so, you know, I repeated this pattern of being a transient as I got, as I went to college, I kind of went to college and I got out and I had a few not so great jobs. Um, and I was, you know, I was like everything from a caterer to a cook, to a bus driver, to a phlebotomist. I was a medical records clerk. Uh, clerk. I drove, uh, let's see, I drove a bus for a little while. I was a summer camp counselor. I was a landscaper, a book buyer. I, so I did everything. Um, a Cheryl calls it a Renaissance woman, but really, I just was kind of just like, you know, I was like a ping pong ball. Where do I belong? Uh, and looking for something that fit me. And uh, so, um, so there was this kind of feeling not quite settled in my life. The second thing, and the most, in, I think the, probably the most contributing factor for me of why did I end up in the mountains is because in my family, I was born a girl and girls were second class citizens. So when my father predicted, I had two brothers, when my father predicted what we would be when we grew up, my brother Chris, he would be an astronaut, and my brother Steve, he would be a scientist, and I, I would be Miss America. That was like the best thing that my dad imagined for me. And the problem with that is that I've never, that's never been me. I don't fit that kind of 
traditional standard of beauty. Um, and I've never wanted to, it's not my thing. And I also felt myself not to be kind of frail and um, uh, not to be, uh, what's the word I want? I, well, anyway, I don't think of myself as frail. Uh, and so I had this kind of conflict. I couldn't resolve what was being held up for me as the ideal and what I felt as myself. And I think this disconnect is something that a lot of women feel because of how society, you know, with the pictures it shows us of how we should be or how we should look or um, who we should marry. And, and just, just in case you, I, you think that I'm just talking to, we're all just of an older generation, I want to tell you that I teach first years at CU. And every year I meet women who have been sent to college to find a husband. So it's not, it has not gone away. Uh, these things still happen in our society. Um, so, um, you know, I, I didn't, I, it was clear. I mean, really the best thing I could be was somebody's wife. And, you know, after watching my dad and my mother's relationship was, was, which was not healthy. And my dad, the way my dad really pressed my mom, mother under his thumb, I thought, you know, that's just not going to be me. It's just not going to be me. So what happened is that I had this very strong personality. I'm a Taurus, like the bull, right? So I um, developed my kind of personality in opposition. Like I said, no to everything. Um, and this is where this, I think I call it in the book, my cowgirl ethos. This is kind of this idea that I was going to be independent. I was going to be the Marlboro man. I was going to be the lonesome guy on the horizon. Um, and so I started, you know, camping alone. I, I wanted to show people that I wasn't weak. So I started camping alone. I started doing things alone. I started, and I think that's one of the reasons why I kind of this isolated mountain lifestyle really appealed to me. Um, so those things kind of drove me to the mountains. But then what the mountains served me up was so much different than uh, what I could have ever imagined what I could have ever have predicted. So I'm just gonna read you just a little, a couple of little tiny uh, uh, passages about my uh, cowgirl ethos. Um, this is from a chapter in my book called Marlboro Woman. Um, so the book starts and I lose everything, which is the present moment. And then I backtrack for three chapters and I kind of cover my childhood and try to explain how did I get to the mountain. And, you know, there's a bit about my family and it's not just that I was a second class citizen. It's, you know, that my dad was pretty um, authoritarian and, uh, and uh, definitely somebody to run from. So I was getting lots of messages that, uh, you know, I just, the, the kind of woman I was, was a kind of palatable woman. You know, I got called bossy. I still get called bossy. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm too opinionated, I'm too, whatever, I'm too direct. Uh, and uh, I kept feeling like there was really no place for me, not only not in my family, but really not in um, society either. When I was a freshman in college and I was struggling with biology, you know, as, you know, making the leap from high school to college, which is a huge leap. And I now teach those first years and understand and kind of <laughs> sympathize like how they're so, freaked out. They have no, like, what do you mean? I didn't get an A on this test. I always got A's before. So I went to my advisor and I was struggling in biology and it was my major. And uh, cause I was pre-med, I wanted to be a medical doctor. And she said, and she looked at me and she said, well, have you thought about pre-nursing? And so the, the, <laughs> the idea that I would just, you know, like, cause, cause I was a girl and because maybe it was too hard for me. And, and, and people flat out, they did not hide the fact, like people flat out told me, someone said, you want to be a doctor? You're going to be, have to be twice as good to be considered okay. And, and so again, I'm, I, we're not, I'm actually now on to writing another book about this, I think, um, because I don't think we, we have really moved past this, the way we think about women and the way we treat them necessarily. So anyway, this is my cowgirl ethos. Um, after I left home, I tested my swagger every chance I got, proud to be called fearless and tough. I arm wrestled with guys and down shots of bourbon with the steeliness of the cowboy hero, once drinking 16 shots of wild turkey at a friend's Thanksgiving turkey trot by excusing myself at shot 12 to throw up and then return for the win. Please don't do this on your own. It was sheer force of will. I simply would not lose. I picked up the art of the bluff from my poker playing father 
And like him, my cool was le legendary. So it's just about this kind of, one of the talks I do is called um, <laughs> Marlboro Woman. And it's about this idea that I didn't, in the absence of you know role models, women who would say, this is how you can be a strong wo a woman in the world, I kind of started to be my dad, essentially. So, um, so, but uh, the woods were the one constant in those years. I camped all over Colorado and in parts of Utah with girlfriends and at times alone, once settled on a wide bend in the Green River in Stillwater Canyon, Utah. I had watched the sun fall beneath a horizon formed by three distinct geologic formations. The passage of a thousand years manifests in the shapes of rocks my own timeline was minuscule by comparison. The thought gave me comfort to be a speck in a magnificent landscape, to be a part of ceaseless beauty. That night, as I contemplated the deep dome of glitter above, I thought about the Catholic heaven of my childhood, the place of eternal peace. I'd long ago given up the church, and as a little girl, I'd often cried at night in bed as I tried to remember imagine forever in a cloud filled elsewhere populated by ethereal ghosts. It no longer mattered that there would be pearly gates or angels or even God. That kind of perfection had lost its sway. My preference was for the earth with its rough beauty, its inscrutability, its mixture of shit and muck. I know what the world is made of. And I still love all, all of it, says Raina, the spirited ranch hand, and Gretel Ehrlich, the solace of open spaces. So that's, um, I've dropped my earbud, which I'm going to now uh, get back here. Um, that's uh, kind of, so I was this toughie, and I was, um, you know, the, the woods were the place that I felt most comfortable, so I gravitated toward them. And, you know, without a family or society who felt like they could uh, hold me, I simply walked off the map. And if you've, maybe you've read Mary Austin, she has a beautiful story called The Walking Woman, which is about a woman in uh, the early part of the 20th century who walks off her name. Um, so she had gotten a long illness, it says, by taking care of an in invalid. And she walks off her name, and in walking off her name, she also walks off what she calls the looking and the seeming which are these kind of gender expectations that are placed on women. Um, and so I did the same thing in some ways. I rejected a society that seemed to reject me, which is kind of like my life in a nutshell. Um, so, uh, so that's how I uh, got to the mountains. Uh, and I, I think, you know, and of course, like, you don't ever do any of this stuff in your life, like consciously. I, you just kind of, something happens and you move. Um, uh, you know, but I did want to be in a place that uh, where I could be myself. And you know, let's face it, all of us who live in the mountains know that the mountains are populated with people who want to be themselves. And some of their forms take, you know, my neighbor's form of being themselves is not my form of being themselves, but the mountains are full of people who feel like society doesn't fit them for some reason. Um, also, mountains are notorious for the high incidence of alcoholism and mental illness. So um, there's a lot of peripheral. I'm, I just want to tell you that I'm walk, looking out my window right now, there's a little fox running by. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, so, um, so uh, you know, kind of, I say in the book, in, you know, in settling down for the first time in my life, which was just at 39, my commitment was not to a person, but to a place. Um, I really committed to that land. Uh, I, I placed my bed on landscape and I put all my chips on wildness. And the first thing that happens, of course, is that my house burns down. And so there's my lesson about wildness. It's not uh, romantic. Um, and, you know, I just didn't want to do what I was told to do, which was to get a job and get married and settle down. And by, me, by a job, I mean a, like a nine to five job, which I have never, well, I, I had very few. Um, I instead, I went on a quest. I wanted an authentic life. Uh, and a life of my own making. So um, landscape did have a profound effect on me. 10 years is a long time to live alone. And it's a long time to, you know, live by the seasons. Uh, my cabin was 500 square feet. It was made of uh, wood two by fours. 
which meant they were kind of the equivalent of wood blocks. <laughs> and so everywhere, the, and there, that, was, that was it. They were just, you know, that thick. Um, so everywhere they came together, there was a little teeny tiny prick of light that came through. And so in the winter time on one wall, if I, you know, you know, in January when the, the, the wind comes through and, and it's, the air is like ice, it's crystallized, it's really beautiful. But I would wake up because that would be kind of falling gently on my face. So it was rustic. Uh, it was rustic. Um, there was no, um, I spent the first single pane windows. I spent the first, it was up on pylons uh, surrounded by a rock wall. So, and they had put pieces of insulation in there, but until I discovered Uggs, which saved my life, it was freezing in there in the wintertime. Um, but I, and, uh, and it was heated, there were a couple of backup electric heaters, which of course did nothing, um, you know, in December, December through February. And so I would get up in the morning and I would start a fire, but I also on really cold days, I would, you know, turn on the oven and open the door. Uh, and turn on the dryer, which was vented inside so that the hot air would come into, into the house. So it's a, it's a peculiar kind of living, and a, but it's a really interesting contemplative kind of living. And of course, I write most, I write a lot about winter in the book because winter is so striking. You know, I write that, you know, there were times when the sound of my own voice startled me. Now, I do have a companion in the book. There are three, uh, relationships the primary kind of relationship that holds me is this relationship to landscape it holds me in place it allows me to sink in um, it softens my tender parts but then in comes this dog who's been my companion and his name is elvis he's a white husky and uh he's the thing that really kind of i you know i thought i had to be tough and uh he's the thing that i say he inserted himself between my breastplate and my skin which is you know, the love of a dog is no small thing. They, that's the thing about dogs is that they have a way of working miracles in your life, I think. Um, but the thing that, really the thing that happened to me was that, you know, and those of you who live year round in the mountains or in remote places know this, the just the accretion of weather um, and passages of seasons changes you. You know, like I, one of the things that drives me nuts is when I drive down to Boulder and I see somebody wearing, you know, a tank top in um, January. And I think, you know, it's 20 degrees outside, dress like it, you know, like, or, or somebody who, we live in these very climate controlled environments and there's something about having to make your own wood fire every morning to get warm or, you know, staving off the you know summer invasion of brown squirrels or living with bears or you know whatever I we have foxes we just had a moose the other day that's huge um, you know right outside of our on our deck um, so there's something about living in the presence of closer to the natural world and in the presence of also you know animals but also particularly uh, big mammals I think that is it's a different thing. Um, so, and I think it's life changing. Um, so I want to read you a little bit. Uh, oh, so, okay. So these two, three relationships, landscape, my dog, and then there's the town of Jamestown, uh, Colorado. And so, you know, I thought I was just going to be a curmudgeon. Well, <laughs> for the rest of my life, I was going to be a loner at the very least. And uh, I lived about four miles above Jamestown. And you know, I worked at the Merck, uh, but I just kind of did my time and then left and uh, honestly looked down my nose at, at the people in town. I wasn't like them. I didn't like to stand around a bear fire and drink beer and smoke pot. Um, it just wasn't me. And, uh, uh, and so I wasn't, in my heart, heart wasn't very kind or tender toward these people. And so what happens? Um, my house burns down. I've been back, I had lived in and around Jamestown for a while, but mostly it was kind of like a ghosty figure. I've been back kind of from after graduate school for just about a year. My house burns down, I am sudden, suddenly absolutely penniless and I need everything and I have no assistance coming in. I, I didn't have renter's insurance because I'm old enough that when I started renting, nobody did. Uh, and, um, the and so what happens is the town of Jamestown comes to the rescue. 
and they throw me a benefit and uh, they have a band and they have items to bid on. And uh, Joey, my cantankerous kind of like boss at the Merck who was never nice to me, puts a big jar out on the bar of the Merck that's the um, cafe in town and these people drop money in it for me. And it was a real lifeline. It was that, that moment was a life changing moment for me to stand at that on the periphery of my own benefit and watch people come to help me. People I hated, people who I knew didn't like me that much. And this is one of the things I learned about community. And I feel like despite what's going on in our country and this kind of division that we're feeling, I feel like when we have these communities and our community was bound together by place, um, the real, real community is not a bunch of like-minded people getting together to kind of like sing Kumbaya. Real community is people who, no matter what happens, will drop something the minute you need help and come running um, because you belong to their community. And, um, and I was, that was, uh, that was a heart changing moment for me. Uh, so I get this, um, they, they raise money and they kind of help me get on my feet and somebody finds me a free place to live for four months and friends, you know, I get to order friends around, they go and get stuff for my dog. And it was, it was amazing. And I would never have survived. If I had my house had burned down in Boulder, that would have been the end of it. So anyway, so I want to read a few passages now. And, and then I'll take questions. And let's see, I've got, uh, I've got a couple of passages about I wish I could see your faces. I was, I have, I would just ask you what you want to hear me read, but um, I'm gonna pick for you. Um, so this this uh, passage is really about kind of how I softened over the course of seasons, and it's from a chapter called Summer. And all of these selections are like a page and a half, so they're not that long. Um, so this one's the longest, maybe. Summer warm suddenly as it often did. One day was spring with lilacs and forsythia popping out along the apron of mountains that led to the plains. And then next, the temperature blasted into the 80s. Up on Overland Mountain, after weeks of uvulating highs, the days quite suddenly shifted to a perfect 78 degrees. Wildflowers were exploding in the meadow behind the cabin and around the peeper pond. As people in Boulder sweltered in near 90 degree heat, almost 3,000 feet down canyon, I stalked the meadows with Elvis in temperate air, collecting flowers from my notebook, the soft fuzzy heads of pussy toes, which looked exactly like the delicate, cat, like delicate cat's paws, the lemony pod-like flowers of golden banner, and the faded purple of lupin. Beneath each variety flattened and taped to the page, I wrote its name, and the date in an honest attempt to get to know my neighbors. When I'd first moved to the Bar K cabin, which is the cabin that burned down, staking my claim on landscape was the equivalent of stubbornly planting a flag and proclaiming territory. It was an act of conquest. I would seize the wild. I'd gotten exactly what I'd asked for. The unharnessed life I sought shoved its way into view the day my house burned to the ground. I didn't know then the strength of my own desire. I've never been someone who takes the easy road. Something in my body gravitates toward rocks and sharp edges, toward storms and umbrage. The summer I spent living in a tent in James Canyon, after I changed my name, I changed my name to my mom's maiden name. I decided what I needed was a few nights alone on a mountaintop contemplating my soul. I would, I would fast and sleep out in the open, I would set off with, rain with a rain tarp and some water and climb straight up out of the gulch to the top of Castle Peak, pulling myself hand over foot up its steep face, trying not to look down or think of falling. It was August hot. And by the time I reached the summit, I had drunk most of my water. That evening, a thunderstorm rolled in as I watched lightning flick and stab, moving closer and closer. And I realized I was sitting on the highest point in any direction. Unwilling to give up, I lay flat on the ground and sang to the storm. The next day, out of water, I returned early along a path I discovered on the bank 
on the backside of the mountain that meandered sweetly into a gulch. I'd softened a bit over the years. Now I wanted kinship, not conquest. At the High Lake Cabin, the place I spent 10 years, I wanted to become part of the pattern and the passage of seasons. So I wrote it all down, the first pass to the final purple aster that bookended the growing season, the weasel who lived beneath the house and turned snow white in winter, the chipmunk who let her pups to drink rainwater from a basin carved out of rock just east of the garden, the two pine systems I drove to the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center after I found them sluggish beneath the bird feeder. Over time, I'd filled notebooks with what I saw, and in those details grew the story I shared with Overland Mountain. Don't try to write the poem about love, I often tell my students. Write the poem about making apple galette for your lover, about your grandfather's hands as he ties flies. Let love rise out of the details. So I collected plants and weather, wildlife and birds, and in between the spaces of my notebook, love rose like a fish to the surface, like clouds of pine dust in the air. So uh, I, my relationship and I changed, uh, my relationship to the world and I changed because of living in a place for so long, uh, so close to wild things. Let's see what I got here. Um, I'm going to read a couple of pieces. One of the things that, um, one of the reasons I always say that I wrote this book was because people kept saying to me, and they were admittedly people who didn't live in the mountains, they would say, why are you living up there all alone? And they would ask me why I was hiding out in the mountains. And I just want to point out that, that this is a question no one asks the man. And um, our, in fact, our, our tradition, our liter literary tradition and our, you know, our kind of tradition of adventure film is of the hero going out alone and discovering himself in landscape. And it's funny, um, I did kind of the same thing that people thought that was odd. And so one of the things I talk about with this book is that I think there is a real need to uh, look at and celebrate and uh, represent and find women's stories of going in alone because there are a lot of us out there. Um, and um, anyway, so I'm going to read a little bit about what people said to me. Um, to friends off the mountain, I was in peril. I lived outside a presumed net of safety, one knit together by proximity to society, people, hospitals, law enforcement things that was implied that as a woman I required. I don't know where you get this, my city-fied grandmother said when I recounted a bear story or when I lit out for territory with Elvis, as if I would developed a sudden appetite for eating animal carcasses and wearing pelts. This from the woman whose husband herded sheep in Utah by himself when he was 14. It was in my blood. I would take my chances with nature any day. There was an open door policy on the mountain and like a lot of people, I left my door unlocked whether I was home or not. Joey kept a key to the mark above the front door, a habit that occasionally resulted in folks helping themselves to coffee or cigarettes. Karen Z, my best friend, stored her, the keys to her pickup truck in the ignition and, and of her unlocked vehicle. I liked living in a place where it wasn't necessary to bolt the door, where I didn't feel a dangerous someone was trying to get in. And even if I was living in some remote wilderness, and I wasn't by any stretch of the imagination. I was safe from the ancient root soul, meaning whole. And I found my wholeness in solitude and space. Everything in nature, says the writer Gretel Ehrlich, invites us to be constantly what we are, not who, but what. On the most basic level, I was landscape too. Even though my intention in moving to the mountain may have been rooted in the state, the natural world coaxed me back into myself. It wasn't unlike what Hindu mystics tell us happens to the self over time with meditation practice. You learn to let everything drop away. Ehrlich says it this way. We are often like rivers, careless and forceful, timid and dangerous, lucid and muddied, eddying, gleaming still. We are all of that and none of it at all. 
I'm just going to read a few more pieces for you. Um, so I really became an observer of place, and that's really how landscape, and I didn't mean it, but it definitely did its magic on me. Um, I really want to return to this idea of the alchemy of wild places and say that I think, you know, we have an opportunity in these historic times. I know a lot of us are feeling the loss of our friends and our family and maybe our, even our job. Uh, but I also think in, in the absence of all these things, something else is going to happen. And um, I don't know why I'm so shamelessly optimistic, but I am. I think uh, this is an amazing time to be alive. I think we get to be less distracted. We get to be more quiet. I'm a meditator, so those things are all good. There goes my earbud again. Um, and we get to be alone. Uh, I think which for some of us may be hard, for some of us maybe it's not. Um, but I think uh, we get to deepen our relationship with our own wild nature. And I think uh, the natural world offers us that opportunity, you know, to listen, to observe, to simply be. Um, you know, uh, just uh, gathering the scent of trees or taking a walk or sitting on the ground. Um, one of the things I was, after I left Jamestown, I was, I like to say I was exiled for a few years. Um, I moved in with my now husband uh, and we couldn't, it was after the flood and we couldn't find any rentals on the mountain. Things were, you know, have evaporated. And uh, so we moved, I euphemistically called it the prairie, but it was Longmont. And uh, it was soul killing to me to live in a place where I stepped on concrete every day. Um, so, so I don't know, I just have this affinity, like if I can touch the earth, I'm okay. So, um, and I do think that now we're beginning to see how um, society is really flexing to change. Um, I think our priorities are shifting. And, you know, so I'm advocating for this relationship um, for a real familial, not familiar, but familial relationship with the natural world and the, and the reciprocity of that, something that's, that there, in which there's reciprocity. So it's a relationship. Um, uh, you know, I've been reading, uh, many of you have, might, might have read this book, but I'm reading, um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And um, one of the things I was reading about um, just recently was about how in her native language, she's trying to learn it. And uh, there are 70% of the language are verbs. So there are not nouns, like it's not a bay. Instead, it's to be a bay, the, a body of water. Um, and so the, the verb expresses the beingness the life force, the existence of the bay. And I thought, how marvelous. And, and that, you know, language structures how we think and how we act. And how marvelous to kind of think of the natural world as alive like that, as, a, as being a verb instead of an object, a noun that is dead. Um, um, she calls this the grammar, grammar of animacy, which I think is really interesting. Um, you know, kind of uh, the sensuousness, sensuousness my gosh, what a word, or aliveness of something that we normally think of as a noun. And so this for me is the alchemy of wild places. Um, it's not really all, only about chemical change. It's about shifting our molecular structures, I think. And I think, I think this is the time we're going to do it. Um, I'm going to read you just two other passages from the book that talk about uh, this shift for me. Um, uh, one of them is a, a, an encounter I have with my dog, Elvis. Um, on the solstice, I encountered a curious coyote who stepped absentmindedly between two junipers toward us as I sat in the late afternoon of the longest day near an overlook just past the peeper pond. I had discovered a roughened stone spiral and a grouping of rocks and gathered more get, and, and gathered more to fill in its gaps, my own personal semaphore to welcome summer whose, official, whose official arrival I'm used mark the now dwindling days. The spiral contained the mystery of that contradiction, a beginning that presaged an end, the ever-changing flux of seasons. But it also recalled my hard and soft edges, the unraveling that I had begun to feel, not the unraveling of the fire, the way I'd felt shorn of everything but grief but the unraveling of fists held too tight for too long. 
of borders becoming porous, my body slackened, opening to pleasure. I was staring at the spiral's arm rotating out and radiating in when the coyote came into view. The animal's mottled gray and russet fur blue and scruffy patches along her neck. Long legs dangled loosely from her body. Her eyes were gold. Gently, I put my hand to hold my dog's harness. Elvis's ears moved forward and his tail made a friendly swish in the dirt, but he didn't so much as growl. It's okay, I said. Even he, even he sensed the extraordinary nature of what was happening. 15 feet away, the coyote took four automatic steps to us before she saw us. Clearly, she'd come this way before. As fluidly as she appeared, she disappeared, turning with neither alarm nor hubbub, angling back over the small rise. Just another animal in the landscape. And then I just have one more piece for you. Oh, I'm running out of time. Um, and this is, you know, so, so landscape worked on me in that way that I talk about in the beginning quote about the, you know, kind of the, you know, the trickle that becomes the river. And it really reshaped my life and uh, allowed me to kind of see uh, differently. Uh, so this passage is uh, kind of after I've had a big dinner party and I'm alone again, uh, a big dinner party with a bunch of couples. Um, a waxy moon shimmered through the kitchen window and aspens were silvery ghosts against a star-filled sky. An owl hooted across the snow-covered meadow. To some, it was a lonesome sound. In fact, aren't you lonely was the question most often asked of me after, aren't you afraid? My answer was taped to my computer, something Natalie Goldberg had been told by the Zen master Katagiri Roshi, anything you do very deeply is lonely. When I first read the words, they were my anthem. I would embrace a solitary life and not be afraid. I wanted them to be, remind me of what I'd chosen, that space and solitude were light for me. There were indeed times when mountain living was lonely, but being lonely, the way Roshi meant it, I'd come to realize, was not really about isolation at all. Instead, it was about embrace. Lonely is a word that describes what it means to live profoundly. Moving deeply in the world, you let the thousand distractions fall away and you become more authentic, more who you really are. Only on its surface was lonely a reckoning, the price of sinking in, but it was not terrible. And as a result of so much time and space, seasons and land, I uncovered so much tenderness. It did not make me weep. And paradoxically, I touched more. Wendell Berry says, only after we have discovered the world for ourselves, do we cease to be alone. I looked at the window, out the window, it was a beautiful landscape, a lovely quiet night. I blew out the candles and slipped into my bed, pulling a pillow to me, relieved and a bit sad to be on my own again. Thank you so much, and I would love to answer your questions.